All right, we're continuing to work our way kind of from the outer part of the prokaryotic cell to the inner part of the prokaryotic cell in terms of the different parts and the functions. And in the last set of notes, we finished off with the cell wall. So now we're going to work on uh, looking at the cell membrane and then just kind of reviewing some of those cell transport processes that we covered in biology. May have been a couple years for some of you, so we're going to just do a quick review of some of those. Uh, and then we'll keep working our way in and kind of finish up with some of the other internal um, prokaryotic structures. So as you remember, the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so it, that means two layers of these phospholipids. So here's one phospholipid right here. So the heads of those um, are hydrophilic and polar. Hydrophilic means um, water loving. And the tails are hydrophobic and made up of lipids and these are water fearing. That's what that means. Okay, so you see that there's a double layer. Here's the layer and here's another layer. And so those heads face out of the cell and into the cell because that's where water is found, okay? These little tails here face each other because they do not want to be wherever there is water. <laughs> so that's why they face each other like that. We also have a bunch of peripheral proteins that are just embedded into the surface of the cell membrane. Uh, we have integral uh, proteins, which are transmembrane, as well as channel proteins, and we have glycoproteins, so all sorts of different proteins embedded throughout. So some of these, especially the channel proteins, uh, various pores, they will let materials pass in or pass out of the cell through those pores, through those channel proteins. Other ones act as kind of like marker proteins where they might um, uh, mark the cell for what type of cell it is, like is this a liver cell or a kidney cell, is it your cell or is it my cell, that plays a role of identifying that cell for your immune system. And other like receptor type proteins might um, get a message from the outside and then relay that to the inside of the cell. We call the cell membrane a fluid mosaic model because it's very um, viscous, you know, so it's very, it has that fluid ability. The phospholipids can rotate and move laterally, and so they can kind of shift past each other. That gives it its fluid. The proteins can move as well past each other. So they're not rigidly fixed in place. The fact that they can kind of slide and move around in the membrane makes the membrane very fluid. It looks like a mosaic. If you've ever seen a mosaic, it's like a, those pictures that have little tiles of different colored pieces in there. Um, well, your cell membrane is like a mosaic in that it has all these proteins embedded in the surface. And so if you were to look at it like kind of from the top view, it almost looked like a mosaic. Um, the functions of the um, plasma membrane, or remember, cell membrane means the same thing, um, allows, basically allows materials into and out of the cell. That's its main job. We say it's selectively permeable or semi-permeable. Because it allows passage of some materials, but not everything. So some materials can pass through, other things cannot. There's also enzymes there uh, for ATP production. Because prokaryotes, um, don't have that mitochondria like a eukaryote would to 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 make ATP. So they, um, the plasma membrane helps with that function for um, prokaryotes. They can t can contain photosynthetic pigments um, called uh, chromatophores or thylakoids. So for those bacteria that are photosynthetic bacteria, they have that ability to carry on photosynthesis. So some of those pigments would be found in the plasma membrane. Um, the things that are going to um, cause the most damage to the plasma membrane are alcohols, and so that's why we always spray down our tables with alcohol. That's why you use alcohol wipes, you use 
um, you know, hand sanitizers that have alcohol in them because that's going to cause damage to the member plasma membrane of those bacteria and therefore hopefully kill them so it doesn't make you sick. So alcohols, detergents, and then um, certain types of antibiotics can cause leakage of the cell contents. Um, when we talk about cell transport, if you remember, we, we break it down into passive transport and active transport. Passive transport um, does not require any energy, and so one of the most basic types is simple diffusion. That's movement of any kind of a solute, any kind of a material from high concentration to an area of low concentration. So it's passive transport because it does not use energy. Okay, so that's the most basic thing. You have these molecules on the outside, they just pass right through the membrane by simple diffusion from high to low concentration. Another type of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion. And that's where we need to use channel proteins that help in facilitating uh, the movement of a molecule still from high to low concentration. So if molecules can just pass through the membrane just as they are with, with no help, it's simple diffusion. If they have to pass through a channel protein, um, then it's considered facilitated diffusion. And these um, uh, proteins are often called transporters or permeases that kind of um, help out with that. Osmosis is the movement of water, water only, across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, so all three of these, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis are all passive transport. They do not use energy. They're all moving materials from high to low concentration. It's just that osmosis only deals with the movement of water. And we, we often talk about osmotic pressure. That's the pressure needed to stop the movement of water across the membrane. So once that cell fills up so full with water, well, we don't want to keep moving water into the cell, and otherwise it could cause that cell to burst. And so we say that that has a lot of osmotic pressure building up. And there you can see it's just an example of water moving through the membrane. Okay, some other terms that we have are hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. Um, we're going to use some um, models to kind of show that with you. But basically, if you have more solute outside the cell than in, that is a hypertonic solution. Okay, if you have equal amount of solute inside and outside, that's an isotonic solution. And if there is less solute outside the cell than in, that's a hypotonic solution. And so each of those is gonna affect what happens to the cell based on um, what, what is surrounding that cell. So if we have an isotonic solution and there's equal amount of solute in and out of there, that means there's an equal amount of water in and outside of it too. So water will move uh, equally so we say there's no net movement, that cell will stay the same size. If it's in a hypotonic solution, now you have a whole bunch of water outside because there's hardly any solute, so it's almost all water. That's going to go rushing into that cell. Well, that cell will get bigger, and if it doesn't have a cell wall, it could actually cause that cell to burst. And then if it's in a hypertonic solution where you have, let's say, you have a bunch of salt surrounding the cell, and not very much water, water will always move from high to low concentration. So in this case, it's gonna move out of the cell and that cell will shrink and we cause that shrinking of the cytoplasm we say that that's called plasmolysis. That can cause damage to a cell too. So how does water move through cells? Um, through things called aquaporins, those are water channels. So those are special channel proteins that just allow water to move through. Because water is a polar molecule, so it would have difficulty um, going through the lipid uh, bilayer. Um, so sometimes if it interacted with those 
lipids. So sometimes it just goes through these aquaporins as well. But they can still water can still go through the lipid bilayer too. Uh, e either way, it can it can work, but uh, the aquaporins help it out with it. So those are the two ways it can move through. Again, um, the other type of if it's not passive transport, the other type is called active transport. And this is movement from low to high concentration. Now you're going against the concentration gradient. And so that re requires, again, a transport protein or a channel protein. Okay, Requires the use of energy. We have to spend some ATP to do this because you're going against um, the concentration gradient. Sometimes you can do group translocation where um, you might have to have a larger substance moving through, uh, and that substance sometimes needs to be chemically altered to do that. Um, so that's your cell membrane or plasma membrane. Um, prokaryotes still have cytoplasm. Again, that's that thicker aqueous substance made up of 80% water. Uh, that's going to contain all your various nutrients and so on, and it's going to include some of your other internal structures floating around in there. The nucleoid is the single, it's just kind of the area where the DNA is found. So it has that single long circular bacterial chromosome. There's no nuclear membrane, no histone proteins. Um, you can also have what are called plasmids. These are small circular pieces of DNA. Okay. These are often um, carry genes for antibiotic resistance. They carry genes that are not crucial for survival. Okay, in other words, your, the actual bacterial chromosome has the genes on it that allow that bacteria to keep replicating and, and surviving. But the plasmids often have antibiotic resistance genes, which, which also help <laughs> that bacterium. Um, bacteria have ribosomes. Again, remember those are the sites of protein synthesis. These are not membrane bound though, and that's why we distinguish that from um, when we say, oh, prokaryotes don't have any organelles. Well, they don't have any membrane bound organelles, but they do have an organelle in the form of a ribosome. Um, they differ from eukaryotic ribosomes in size and number of proteins, and they are ribosomal RNA. And there's lots of antibiotics that work with, um, with, um, to inhibit protein synthesis. Um, so that's another way that they can, antibiotics can attack. So all of these here, the chloramphenicol, streptomycin, gentamicin, erythromycin, those are all ones that try to attack protein synthesis. And then there's lots of different inclusions. You won't really need to um, memorize or know these, just know that they often, are just storage areas that help, you know, when nutrients are plentiful, they can help store some of those extra nutrients in those inclusions. Some uh, bacteria can form endospores. Um, when these are just kind of dormant cells or resting cells when nutrients are depleted. Um, so it allows a bacterium to actually kind of survive and just stay in a dormant stage until um, things get better. So they're resistant to drying out, which is desiccation, heat, chemicals, radiation. Um, and couple, two of the main ones are bacillus species and clostridium. Um, clostridium botulinum. <laughs> it's the bacterium that causes botulism, which is a huge problem with, you know, if you're canning or the canning industry. Um, because if that bacterium goes into its endospore state and can survive the canning process and then later on as conditions get better and the canning you know the can cools off and the materials are packed and you let it sit on your shelf and all of a sudden it starts to bulge that's why they say if you ever see a bulging can or if you do home canning and the lid has popped off don't don't eat that material don't eat that salsa don't eat that spaghetti sauce because it could mean that there are bacterium in there um, that cause that seal to break or that's causing that bulging of that can. And so you just throw those out um, because they can cause, usually they have um, 
endotoxins in them that can cause uh, very, very deadly food poisoning. And so you don't want that. So big problem for the food industry, for the canning industry. And this just kind of shows you how they can form those. They can just, they just form this extra little um, coating around them and then they're freed from the cell and they can just stay in that state until conditions get better. All of a sudden there's plenty of nutrients in water and now they can just develop and grow into their, because they've got their chromosome in there still, so they can become a bacterial cell later on. So some of you may see that yours forms spores because it will have this, this little white area inside the cell. So we'll, as those pop up, I'll see if I can show.